Well, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to those of you that are joining us via this webinar or listening to us on the podcast. Um, today, we're going to be talking about kids and screens. Can we help them strike a balance? I'm Diana Graber. I'm the author of Raising Humans in a Digital World and founder of Cyber Civics and CyberWise. Here, as always, with Dr. Pamela Rutledge, who is the director of the Media Psychology Research Center. And we're really excited about our two guests today. Um, we're welcoming Amy Webster and Amina Mohamud. Did I say that correctly? Yes. <laughs> they are the Youth Engagement Director and Coordinator of Live More, Screen Less. This is a Minnesota-based nonprofit that partners with school communities to promote digital well-being and to help youth manage their screen time. So let's talk about screen time for a moment. Uh, I, I feel like we kind of grabbed you all here by putting the word screen time in our title. I'm not a big fan of that word, and we'll talk about why today. Um, it puts a lot of fear into parents. And, you know, I learned this firsthand. I do a lot of parent presentations, and at the end, I get excited about the Q&A, and I'm waiting for the questions on AI and reputation management and misinformation. And all parents want to talk about is screen time. Every question is screen time. They're worried about it. Research shows their kids are worried about it, probably because we're worried about it. So. Today, one of the many things we're going to do is talk about what it is that gets parents so worried about screen time, uh, why we're not actually a big fan of that term, um, what is digital wellness, can we achieve it, and most importantly, we're going to share strategies with you to help your own kids maintain balance in their lives. So as we always do, we like to be research grounded in these talks. This is when I turn to Pam because she's the best. <laughs> So Pam, what does the research actually say about screen time and its impact on, on the well-being of kids? Uh, well, first, if I can just nerd out here for just a moment, there are four things to keep in mind when you're looking at research, right? One is that there's a difference between correlation, which is a relationship, and causality, which means something causes something else. There is hardly any research done on media in general and screen time specifically that is causal. It is generally a relational. The other is that journalists like catchy headlines, so they tend to misinterpret the research and say something causes something. And another is you have to look at see what people are actually measuring, which gets us into the problem, Diana, of what you were just talking about, which is what is screen time? Screen time is measured in so many different ways across the literature that it's very hard to draw a firm conclusion. However, recently in the last, say, three years, some meta-analysis review of a lot of different studies have looked at the effect of screen time on things like mental health, on sleep, on uh, well-being, and found that the for moderate use, it's actually a positive effect, not a negative effect. So the real problem areas are people who overuse media or people who are isolated and, and are, don't have access and can't use it at all, because there are positive benefits to connecting with other people. Yeah, I think it's so important to really take a step back and look at the research and and realize we're at a we're at a place now where time is just not a great measure of screen time because these poor kids they have to do work on screens they have to do research on screens they need screens for so many reasons and so we don't want to put that pressure on them to talk minutes but we do want to help kids achieve well being and I think that's why we're all here today and I know Amy and Amina you guys work on this every single day. Um, let's start with you, Amy. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about what your organization does. Sure. So we at Live More Screen Less, we are a nonprofit based in Minnesota, and we exist to advocate and promote digital well-being for and with young people. And we define digital well-being as balanced, intentional, and effective use of technology across and keeping in mind the whole person. So the five dimensions of well-being, our social well-being, our emotional well-being, our mental well-being, our cognitive well-being, and our physical well-being. And our model of for and with young people is, I'm a former school counselor. I used to be that person in the front of the classroom delivering a lesson. Um, learn not super effective for this topic of talking with young people about digital well-being but what is effective is equipping people like my colleague Amina a recent college grad to go in and speak with high school students so let me ask you a question I'm already going off my list of questions which I knew I would do sorry about this but cuz I'm trying to figure out like how do you guys do this is it actually a class is it an assembly is it like 
how many hours a week? Like walk us through your actual job role. Like how does this get accomplished? So we go into high school classrooms, um, our engagements, we have two engagements. Um, we do a one, one of the first engagement is like listening sessions. And the second engagement is just, um, discussions, um, like presentations in front of high school students. Um, and we work, um, we work um, with the high school students in, in classrooms. Um, small, sometimes it's like small and small room discussions with, with high school students. Okay, and Amina, what are you hearing from kids when you do this? Yeah, some of the um, quotes or reflections that students have um, shared with us in our engagements are, um, it woke me up to try to limit my screen use as much as possible. Um, a lot of the students um, don't really realize that they're like they're aware of their screen use, but um, after our, our, facilitations, our facilitations and our engagements, um, they're, they discuss how they're able to monitor and take care of their digital well-being usage, as well as um, it helped motivate them to change. Okay, and then Amy, about how many schools are you doing this with? So we at Live More Screen Less um, had a grant or have a grant from the state of Minnesota. In 2021, our founders, KK and Marie, wrote a grant for four projects. And within these projects, we have a resource library, which is going to be launched next week. We have um, training for educators. And we have a communications campaign and network within the state. And then we have the peer education. So we are really a pilot of figuring out how to make this work. I think we as educators learned a lot of what isn't very effective. And we heard from young people like, please, not another assembly about digital literacy in my footprint. So we have been we have been building this literally from the ground up. It's really quite grassroots. Um, and we are now in the stage of, all right, we have great data on effectiveness and figuring out, all right, how, how do we scale this? So, so I, what what is effective? Uh, you know, so I mean, I'm I'm very curious yeah. because you're you're going into this. Little, are you teaching skills? Are you having them do you know social media diaries? Some things that we sort of talk about how what what are you what are the boots on the ground doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in our engagements, um, how we measure success um, is we provide students at the end of our session, we provide them with exit tickets. And we ask them how some key takeaways of the session and what they found most impactful or useful and if they would recommend this um, session to their peers. So but before the takeaways, like what exactly is the engage? Like, is it a lesson? Or are they doing something? Or are you talking to them? Yes. So one of the things you mentioned um, right off the bat, benefits and drawbacks. So going in and asking young people to express what are your top three benefits of your tech use and your top three drawbacks. Um, Amina and our youth engagement team also share stories from their own experience, which wasn't that many years ago, of positives and negatives of their digital media use. We have films that we created last summer. We were um, at a city park and interviewed high school students go, walking by um, about their tech use and how it makes them feel. And one of our videos that's really impactful is a couple minutes of young people talking very, very from the heart about like, gosh, you know, I'm really disappointed in myself. You know, sometimes I use my screen three to four hours a day. And then the young people who are with us in the engagement, they start laughing and there's a lot of nervousness because they're like, that kid's only on three to four hours a day and they don't feel good. They're like, I'm on for 10 hours a day. Um, so we really worked to reduce isolation. Um, young people are like, oh my gosh, you feel this way too. And so really bringing things out into the open and the fact that Amina and other college students are the ones doing it and not me, old person, high school counselor, um, makes a huge difference in who the messenger is. Interesting. So when you measure success, do you actually, are you able to tell if they use screens less after their engagement with you? 
So in terms of long-term eff efficacy, not quite yet with some of these engagements. With others, what our real bread and butter is our 10 hours of peer ed and leadership training, which is really comprehensive curriculum and experience of those five dimensions of well-being. And we do have great data from those students who have gone through that program. Um, from this spring, we have been doing these shorter engagements to really encourage encourage and welcome high school students to attend our first ever Digital Wellbeing Youth Summit, which is Monday, May 15 in St. Paul. So um, we had a bit of a, a pivot of instead of doing really, really deep engagements with people of trying to have a more um, a quicker type of engagement and see and see what happens and, and where where it lands. Yeah, oh, go ahead, Pam. Oh, no, I was just going to say, so So, if I'm hearing you, it sounds like the focus is really on intentional device use. It isn't on the sort of checking information sources or, you know, the sort of what you might consider standard media literacy or this sort of as the cyber civics curriculum. It's really about intentional and aware, awareness about, about the device use. Do you differ, differentiate between types of use? Do you have them log, you know, when it was, you know, the emotional connection with, with their use? Yes, and uh, a lot of emotional literacy building. So one of the tools that um, we've been using with these engagements that young people really love is the mood meter. Do you want to talk about the mood meter? Yeah, um, so in our engagements, we have students check in with their energy level on how they're doing on a scale to one to eight, how energetic they are. Um, and then um, as well as their pleasantness or their positivity level, checking in to one to eight, how positive or um, pleasant they are. Interesting. And and where where would you say most kids fall on that meter? Um, they usually fall, most kids have been sharing that they're usually at a six or um, six or seven in the mood meter. And do you ask them why they feel that way or what they think is affecting their mood? Yeah, um, some of them, well, some of the engagements that we did in the morning, they usually just say like, they're tired or it's early morning, or um, I know one student shared that they were on their screen for um, quite a long time that night before. So they were feeling like they didn't have any energy or they're low en energetic. Interesting. Huh. And it, it, what other kinds of things do you do with them besides the moon meter? Yeah, so um, we show those listed in two videos that Amy discussed, as well as we have this worksheet where it's called um, digital media practices that students shared using. So we pass out those worksheets and we give students um, a little bit of time to work on it and set intentions and goals in their digital well-being journey, um, as well as like we have them discuss it with like their partner and set um, goals and intentions um, in their journey. Um, um, and then we also work on some um, listening sessions with them as well. We kind of listen to what they have to say in their with their digital media use, and then they share their drawbacks and benefits with digital media. Um, yeah, so um, I feel like these experiences and engagements we've been doing with students have been really effective because a lot of students generally just want like to be heard and listened to from others, especially um, um, adults and then um, child, like um, teenagers and adults their own age. Don't you find that true to Pam that we don't listen to kids enough. <laughs> well, yeah, I think that's I think that's true, and and those kinds of experiences really normalize and and sort of destigmatize what people are feeling and the shame that people might be feeling um, about one thing or another because they these kids do hear a lot of oh my god you shouldn't do something you shouldn't and without any context and that allows them to make make better sense of it you know I think one of the things I love about your stories Diana is that you're always talking about what are what things are the kids interested in learning about? Because they are also media savvy at a certain level, but not in other ways. Yeah, I, what Pam's referring to, I teach cyber civics, but my program's taught to sixth, seventh and eighth graders. And our first year is digital citizenship. And I just had a class where I mentioned to the kids that all these states are enacting laws to keep kids off of social media until they're 18 without parental permission. And they were like, but we use it for so many awesome things. Like we want to learn about AI and we want to learn about art. We want to learn about this. And I thought, you know, we don't listen to the kids enough. Like sometimes what they're doing on screens is so amazing and creative and they're learning things. And I think that we forget that. And, you know, of course, adults are worried. We're worried about time, 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 time. And in doing that, we forget all the really great ways that kids can use their screens. Are you finding that with the kids that you work with? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the other, yes, the other nice positive is, is community and connection for people who, for whatever reason, don't feel as if they have that with people around them in 3D that um, a lot do share, um, finding um, some, some hope and positivity. Um, influential people uh, and positive people, we talk about that a lot. And that's one of the tools Amina mentioned on the digital well-being practices that young people have shared with us, that we love to lift that up of following people and putting your time and intentionality around people who are really lifting you up um, and inspiring you as opposed to <laughs> the opposite that we see so frequently. That's great. Do you um, talk to them at all about the uh, addictive features that are built into technology and how that's working to, on their brains? Do you have any lessons on that? So the persuasive design and the attention economy piece is so key. And sadly, we have learned in our initial engagement, not quite having time for that, but absolutely within our peer ed and leadership curriculum. Um, and then with our intern cohort, so training our college students, it's so amazing for me to see how they feel in learning about, for example, the endless scroll. And they're like, you know, it's just amazing to me. These are really educated college kids, right? And they're like, I had no idea that this endless scroll was just designed to keep me going forever. And they're like, it's really effective at that. Um, and then to watch them shift in figuring out, okay, and yes, of course, you know, behavior change doesn't happen overnight, but knowing that awareness is that first step. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, yes. I, I find that, so I teach that to middle schoolers and it's a great time to teach them that because they're, they're already looking for faults in adults and things that are wrong, you know? And so when you teach them that at that developmental stage, they're like, that sucks. They're doing what my phone's doing what to me. I don't like this. And I've had kids like go off of social media networks because they felt duped, you know? <laughs> so yes. I think effective strategy to teach kids, you know, this is your brain and this is what's happening in there. And this is why it's so hard to like walk away from your Fortnite game when it's time to go to bed. So such I think that's so important because it's not a personal failing. It's how the brain is wired. In other words, these things are designed to take advantage of our natural curiosity and our instinctive reactions to stimulus. It's not because we're a bad person or because we don't have willpower. So understanding that it's not something to feel bad about, but it's a skill to develop can make a really big difference in success of, a, you know, of an effort, but also in how they feel about themselves. Yeah, which brings me to a question that I was curious about, Amina or Amy, either of you can take this, but do you ever find that you walk into a school and there's kids that just go roll their eyes, they don't want to be talked to about this at all? Do you find that? Yeah, um, that <laughs> happened recent times um, with our sessions. Um, we noticed like towards the beginning when we come in, they're just like, oh, another um, session about our phone use or our tech use, but towards the end, we noticed like there a shift in their behavior or um, just their attitude towards us speaking with them and then engaging with them. So I found that, I find that like really, to, I find that to be really like um, impactful to them. Yeah, so it's just, it takes a minute to let them know that you're gonna listen to them and it's like two-way conversation. You're not there to lecture, right? And, and what ages again? I'm sorry. I is this just high school or is it, do you guys start younger than that? So we have started just with high school students because we are working to equip them to then work with younger students. So this afternoon, for example, we have some of our peer leaders from a school and we're going to be speaking with fifth graders. Um, but so with our model, that's where we started was with the high school students. Um, but we certainly know that um, there's a huge need in, in middle and elementary. And I have a second grader, and I know um, from parenting her how incredibly receptive she is to learning, particularly with this approach focused around well-being. So, for example, when one of us parents comes home and is on the phone instead of greeting um, one of us face to face and really allowing for that connection, she will be one of the first to say, hey, get off your phone. <laughs> That's so true. So um, when you talk digital well-being, I'm going to kind of shift here because I hear that term so much right now and it's great because it's important. 
but let's, Pam and I were like di- diving in earlier. Like, what does that actually mean? Like, how do you assess digital well being in terms of just well being overall? Pam, what did you discover about that? Well, I discovered that, that there were 34 different definitions of digital well being. Uh, so it's, you know, some of them are just based on, you know, a program. Some of them are based on psychology because there are wellness and subjective well being measures. That have been validated in psychology. So it's 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 across the board. Some of them are very person centric. You know, what does it mean for the person to have digital well being? Some are sound like more like they're the parents who've read the research and are trying to impose digital well being, where it's coming from a sort of pejorative other focus. So it's it's really all over the map. Yeah. So um, it'd be great. Like I just I want to see these models. Not it's wonderful you guys have it in Minnesota. Do you think there's other states that are following your model or starting something similar in their own states? I don't know that we have that here exactly in California. Just curious. I'm not sure, um, but what I, I do want to speak to what Pam just said, our model at Live More Screen Less with digital well-being is very much that it's the person who is determining what balanced intention and effective use is for them. And for us at Live More Screen Less and working with young people, I think that is part of our efficacy because it's really that own inner authority, the person is making that decision for themselves, as opposed to this outer authority saying, you know, this is going to be what well-being looks like for you. That makes a lot of sense. So do you find that high school kids are equipped to make that assessment after you've met with them? I think they are equipped to think differently and have a idea of, oh, so for, I've talked about this a lot with people. It's like, I think we all seek well-being, but we might, based on our family system, where we grow up, um, who's around us, we might not know what well-being really looks and feels like. So I think part of our role is to plant a seed that digital well-being does exist and and start your journey and 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 I think for all of us I mean to be alive today I think it's an active practice <laughs> daily to to maintain it and I really think that uh we we can't have well-being unless we do have digital well-being um so for me with sometimes well-being can be such a broad broad umbrella and it can feel like gosh I don't even know how to start Whereas with digital well-being, it's like, okay, well, yes, you can do things every day and and see if your use is helping you to achieve your balance and intention. And if it's helping you to feel better and if it's not, then gosh, you know, instead of streaming Netflix after dinner for four hours, maybe, gosh, does it feel better to go out and take the dog for a walk? And um, when you do these engagements with schools and you're done do the schools keep something up or do you revisit to make sure that these practices are talked about? Like, do you change the culture in some manner? So we use the WISC model, the whole school, whole child, whole community model. So very much we are wanting to engage with educators and equip a core group of educators to shift and have digital well-being cultures. So for example, after we meet with young people and and they say things like, oh my gosh, now after learning these things, this is what I want my school leaders to know. And and they say things like, gosh, I'd like assignments on paper, please. And um, please, please get rid of cell phones in the classroom. They're just too distracting. So absolutely working on multiple levels. And when we speak with educators, it's the, the notion that every single one of us has a role to play. So if you're the school nurse, if that means that you're putting up posters about digital well-being in your office, and if you're a teacher who's wanting to do an experiment because perhaps you have a, a cell phone um, policy that's in place, but the practice is that everyone's on their phones all the time, maybe you start an experiment and ask students to volunteer to lock up their phones in, in, your, in your room for a week. Um, We had a teacher do this and students then came back and reported how they felt after a week. Um, The top three words that they shared, free, relieved, and focused. Mm, That tells you everything you need to know, right? (laughs) 
Interesting. Pam, did you have any last questions as we get closer to our end of the half hour? Well, no, not really a question. I just sort of a, a, a comment, side comment is that by teaching people intention, by increasing their own sort of sense of control and agency, you are actually contributing to well-being in terms of from the theoretical perspective. So there's, there's a, especially at an age when kids are feeling sort of powerless, especially after COVID when everyone felt powerless, that's a really important thing to instill in kids is their sense of um, agency and efficacy in terms of making decisions about themselves and then making choices that support those decisions. Yeah. And, you know, I think what's interesting here is that the high schools give you time. I mean, I know with cyber civics, that's always the struggle for me is that they're so busy just meeting all their educational requirements in middle school. It's really hard to find that hour a week to get in a digital literacy class, even though I think it's so essential. Do you find that to be a struggle with you to find time within the high school day? She's shaking her head. Yep. <laughs> One of the struggles. Yep. And I, and I would just say that one of the things that we have tried to do is really um, key into early adopters and people who know that this is really important. Um, yeah, has been a helpful piece. But yes, I mean, the struggles of the school system, um, they are real. Where do they put it in the day? Is it like an advisor period or is it something extra? Right. So it can happen in advisory or what we've been doing is going into like English classrooms, avid classrooms, digital media. So we've been all, been all over. We are curious, you know, there are some some an idea of some credit bearing classes that are these peer education concepts. So that's something that um, we are very much looking into. Yeah. I don't know. This is off topic. It's not off topic, but it's kind of out there. But uh, about a year ago, we did a, a chat with a young man, Dino Ambrosi. Are you familiar with him? Oh, no. God, you guys have to know him. Okay. He's very similar to what you're doing at Cal State Berkeley. And it's now being taught at other universities as a credit class. Okay. Same thing. But he, he goes a lot deeper into, uh, you know, media psychology and you know obviously because it's a it's a college class and it's it's quite robust so uh connect with me later and i'll do the introductions great all right well we're getting close here pam do you have last questions or should we go right into our top tips well i think that you know their top tips are good you know ours are always the same but no i have no more questions it's you know i think it, all of this stuff is incredibly important and uh the, recognizing the perspective of this child, of the student, of the young person is so important in achieving any um, positive outcome. Yeah. And for me, this was a really timely thing to talk about. I, I'm so like anxious and not very happy about all these laws pop popping up everywhere that's restricting kids, restrict, restrict, restrict from social media, et cetera. And it's like, you know, we have to help kids not like put on walls for things that they want to get to that could be positive. So I'm really encouraged to see what you're doing in your state. I, I hope there's people from other states that are listening and will call you to find out how to do it in their own state rather than banning kids from things that they're going to need someday. So kudos to you guys for kind of creating a new model. I know it's not easy to start from scratch. Um, all right, Amina, I'm going to go to you first. Based on what you've learned in the classroom with kids, what would be your top tips to parents to help their kids achieve a balance with screens? Um, yeah, I would say to listen to their children, provide support, and um, set practices and goals for their kids to, with screen use. Great. And you, Amy, what would be your top, top takeaways? Um, I like thinking about what are our screens replacing? So for example, um, is the screen replacing a face-to-face -face game that we could be playing all together or going outside? And um, just having that, ha having that as a frame. And as for us adults, when we think about what were some of the activities that we really enjoyed and brought us joy in childhood, um, are then, uh, are, are people missing out on not having the lemonade stand or, you know, biking down the street someplace. So, um, just having that as a frame of what is this replacing? That's a good one. Good, good little history lesson there. What, what, 
<laughs> I was going to say as a teenager, you know, the, the, I was one of those hanging on the, the phone, right? It, you know, so, so there are a lot of things that, that might not seem normal to an adult that are perfectly normal to a kid in terms of how their world works and how they're connecting. But, you know, I, I, I agree with Amina that, that the, really that has to start with listening to the child. And I think it's so important for parents to set aside their anxieties and be curious because if you start to get judgmental, you close the door. And what you really want to do is you want to hear so that you know where you can help and you know where you can provide structure or intervention or support and activity. So it's, it's really sort of listening in a not judgmental way. Yeah, I think that's so important and, and kind of hand in hand with what all of you guys said, I think to maybe we could put away the term screen time. I, I feel like, I'm, you know, I used it in the title, but I, I don't like the word because the time thing is just not fair to kids. We need to look at what they're doing online and ask them, like, sometimes you're so surprised at what, you know, we're worried that they spend an hour on the computer, but maybe they're like watching videos on something they're learning. So just ask them what they're doing. Be curious. Think of your own time. When you're on screens, it's not always wasted. Sometimes you're doing something very valuable and kids are too. So just have an open mind towards that. Right. And model the behavior you want to see. Right. Exactly. Well, Amy and Amina, thank you both so much. I really, I've been so curious about how it's going in Minnesota. I met your, the people who led your organization years ago, and it's been really inspiring to see how your state has embraced something so important and kudos to you. Um, I hope that by doing this, other people will hear about it and reach out to you to figure out how to do the same model in their state. So thanks for the time that you spent with us today. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And before we go, I have a couple things. Um, we have a partner podcast. It's the Parents Guide to What Kids Watch. Um, hand in hand with this, um, CJ, who has worked with a bunch of different children's programming networks, just finished a podcast last night, and it's about TV time. And it's for you parents that have younger kids. You can find this on the CyberWise uh, website in the same place where you'll find this webinar tomorrow. It's under CyberWise Chats. We also have his podcast listed, listed there. So if you have young children and they're watching a lot of TV and you want to know what's happening with that, please check out that podcast. Yeah, and great. Pam and I will be back in a month. We're actually going to talk about all these crazy laws popping up everywhere. It's, the op it's at the end other end of the spectrum to what we spoke about today. Um, really restrictive laws for social media since, you know, just the last couple of months, two states have enacted laws. We're sure in the next month more is going to happen. So stay tuned. We will send out information regarding that. Um, all right. So thank you everyone for joining us today. I hope you have a wonderful day and thank you again, Amy and Amina. So Good great to meet you. For your great work.